Thank you very much. It's actually my pleasure to be here. Um, it's been an extraordinary eight weeks for my team and I since the announcement of Homo Naledi. I think none of us quite realized the, um, what it meant for a science story to go viral in the way that the Naledi uh, did. We actually pushed the Kardashians off of Twitter uh, worldwide for 48 hours, and I'm very pleased for a science story. Uh, to have done that around the world. I've had a uh, couple of visits overseas and the reception has been extraordinary to the, the unusual interest in, in this discovery. And a, a lot of people uh, ask me why that occurred and I don't know. And I don't have any idea why, why it went viral in the way that it did, but I'm, I'm glad it did because it seems to stimulate something probably near and dear to everyone's heart here, the idea of uh, people engaging in science, whether it be controversially or not, the, the fact that people are talking about it, kids are doing it, and I'll talk a little bit more to that a little later in my, my talk this morning. What I wanted to do, though, was, was bring back some reality to discoveries like this. Often these discoveries are portrayed in the media, reports about them as sort of eureka moments, that is, discoveries that just happen because of a coincidence or because someone did something. Now, very often there's a component to that. And very often people like myself are partly responsible for that as I reflect because it often makes a better story when you're telling it to an audience. But for you particularly, I wanted to go back a little bit and emphasize that, that while there are components to luck in discovery-based sciences like mine and in discoveries like this, there's often a great deal of hard work planning and science behind those discoveries. Um, this journey didn't begin uh, in uh, September of 2013 when, when uh, the two cavers entered that chamber. And I'll, I'll give that detailed story in a moment for those of you who don't know it. It actually began a long time ago. A long time ago with the uh, searches and exploration projects that went on through the 1990s into the early 21st century when uh, we at Witts University, and I think many other universities, were beginning to look at this science of paleoanthropology, the search for human ev evolution, as, as one that was pretty much gone. That is, that we had uh, pretty much known the fossil fields that were to be discovered. In fact, in 2001, uh, perhaps the leading scientist in the world in paleoanthropology, at least the most influential, wrote a paper in the Yearbook of Physical Anthropology that said there will be no new fossil fields discovered and there will be no new major discoveries made in this field of human origins. We have the story outlined. In fact, the fossils are a depleting resource and we should stop training young paleoanthropologists. We have enough right now. And people who haven't prepared fossils before shouldn't actually be allowed to handle them. It should be left to a relatively small number because we are a declining field. That's a fact. You can go read that. Yearbook of Physical Anthropology. That was the state of the nation. Can you imagine what that did for funding? Can you imagine what that did for grant agencies? People like me who had dedicated their lives to exploration found those revenue streams drying up. And, you know, there might have been good reason if you looked at it. As we moved into the early parts of the 21st century, we were not making grand discoveries at new sites of any great extent. The big discoveries like Littlefoot and others around Africa were all made at sites that were already known. They've been known for decades and decades and decades. Um, the sites that my colleagues and I were finding, these small new sites and such, well, they, they weren't recovering much. Little scraps and bits. But we're a field of scraps, traditionally. We were a field that by, the, say, 2005, 2006, there were certainly more paleoanthropologists than there were fossils to study. And that probably tells you more about the people who go into this field than it does about anything else. My life, of course, changed dramatically in 2008 after doing a survey, which I'm sure many of you were familiar with, of using Google Earth to find sites and finally finding a site one kilometer from where I'd spent the previous 17 years working at a site called Gladysville, the center of this cradle of humankind, World Heritage Site, my then nine-year-old son, shouted out to me at a new site I'd found just two weeks before. And Dad, I found a fossil. And of course, as I went over to look at that rock, I saw in that rock a clavicle, which I'd done my PhD on. And that would lead to an extraordinary discovery. One that for a person like me and a scientist like me, 
is utterly and absolutely life-changing. Um, that would lead to the new species, Australopithecus sediba, being named in 2010, just 18 months afterwards, 2 million years old, one of the richest fossil deposits ever discovered in the history of the search for human origins. I'd won the scientific lottery. Um, it is, in a field like ours, you can make a career off the discovery of a mandible, a jawbone. You can make a career off the discovery of a tiny piece. And that is an honest truth. At the time that Malapa and Sediba were discovered, there were only seven partial skeletons known in all the world from these early primitive hominids. It's extraordinary. So we found first two, then others at that remarkable little site. It was life-changing. I had wanted to experiment with things like open sourcing and open access, and I put together a comprehensive and inclusive global team that by the end of the remarkable period of research that we undertook between 2008 and 2013, uh, we'd published over 40 scientific articles, 15 of them in science, three covers of science, several in nature. An incredible period. Extraordinary, extraordinary period for scientists. I promise you, and I'll, I'll, I wouldn't say this probably outside of many other audiences, but you know, if you would told me I could put a, a couple of papers in science or nature every year for the next decade or so, I would have cut my left arm off for one in 2007. Um, it was life-changing. Extraordinary so. The, the work was, was, was sound. It was exciting. By the end of that period, there were something like a hundred scientists collaborating on the project to describe these fossils, describe their context, and all the other things that, that went with that. The site is unremarkable other than being this extraordinary scientific wealth base. The little site of Malapa is little more than a hole in the ground, but it was very quickly in that journey that we realized that it wasn't normal, or at least we were because of the nature of the multidisciplinary team recognizing things we hadn't recognized before. It became clear that, that the Malapa site, besides preserving remarkable, often articulated skeletons two million years old, preserved other things, like organic material. We were finding what appeared to be skin and perhaps hair. We found insect parts, seeds, a preservation environment in the hard, concrete-like rock that surrounded these these fossils, it was giving us insight that was completely unprecedented in, in our field. And, and that led us to have to look at the way we were going to work on this site very, very differently than other sites. Now, I can't tell you whether right now, well, I can't tell you, but uh, I couldn't tell you at the time whether or not this was an anomaly, Malapa was an anomaly in having those sort of things, or whether we had missed them, we'd overlooked them because we didn't anticipate they were there. I can tell you it's the latter, not the former, um, at other sites. But it required me to plan a different sort of thing. And so I had to devise a structure, a laboratory, to go out in this beautiful wilderness area that would go over the site and protect the site and it allows a platform both for the conducting of science but also for the anticipated tourism that was going to go along with a site like this, a site of this magnitude, but also would reflect the importance. And so we had to back out of the site. We had to vacate the site as this structure was going to be built and erected in a very sensitive manner over the top of the site of Malapa. And it was at that moment, and this is now middle of 2013, that I realized that I kind of had nothing to do. We'd spent five years with a very dedicated research plan, pulling the material out that we had, describing it, putting together these huge teams, publishing it in a timely manner, working on open sourcing, open access, and we were finished. And I couldn't get back in. And it was at that moment I realized that I'd kind of made a mistake. I had not been back out exploring since Matthew said, Dad, I found a fossil. That left me in a kind of unusual position, because in that extraordinary period back in 2008, I'd found in a four and a half month period, something like 800 previously unrecognized cave sites and inside of those some fossil sites. But I'd done that effectively on my own, literally walking across the surface with a dog and a stick and sometimes a nine-year-old. 
then that, by the way, I recommend taking nine-year-olds wherever you are in whatever field of science you're in. It's, it's done a lot for me. When you look at this environment out there in the cradle of humankind, and I'm sure many, many of you are familiar with it.